Personal Plan Lecture 2. Okay, Lecture 2 uh, on Personal Plan. Again, this is all look, coming from near-death experiencers. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, that's not true either, because there's a couple who have channeled uh, through mediums uh, this concept of a personal plan. Well, so this now comes from uh, Heavenly Answers for Earthly Questions by Joyce Brown. I now realized my problems were my own personal educational building blocks, tailored just for me. Learning from my problems, the cause and effect from my choices and my parents' and their parents' choices could help me overcome undesired social, cultural, or unwanted family traditions. Suddenly, I knew I would not want to trade places with anyone else. This is where they uh, all put their problems in a bag, and the bag is dumped out, and they all scramble to get their own problems when they see what everybody else. And that's, she's just shared that analogy with us. Uh, I needed to grow and develop in my own way which was different than any other person's way. Someone else's life experiences would not help me to become the individual that I needed to be. I needed my own individualized training. Um, perhaps before I get through, I will do a little object lesson. I call it my paper plate, God and me, uh, to illustrate what's going on here. Okay. Dying to be me by uh, Anita Morjani. Again, she's been on TV quite a bit. Her quote, taken from page 75. In the moment that I made the decision to go on towards death, I became aware of a new level of truth. I discovered, discovered that since I had realized who I really was and understood the magnificence of my true self, if I chose to go back to life, my body would heal rapidly not in months or weeks, but in days. I knew that the doctors wouldn't be able to find a trace of cancer if I chose to go back to my body. How can that be? I was astounded by this revelation and wanted to understand why. It was then that I understood that my body is only a reflection of my internal state. If my inner self was aware of its greatness and connection with all that is God, my body would soon reflect that and heal rapidly. Even though I always had a choice, I also discerned that there was something more. It feels as though I have a purpose of some sort yet to fulfill. But what is it? How do I go about finding it? I perceive that I wouldn't have to go out and search for what I was supposed to do. It would unfold before me. It involved helping lots of people, thousands, maybe tens of thousands, perhaps to share a message with them. Would you believe millions and millions and tens of millions? But I wouldn't have to pursue anything or work at figuring out how I was going to achieve that. I simply had to allow it to unfold.
Life in the World Unseen by Anthony Borgia The principal guide is chosen for each individual on the earth plane in conformity with a fixed plan. Most guides are temper temperamentally similar to their charges in the latter's finer natures. But what is most important, the guides understand are in sympathy with their charges failings. Many of them indeed had the same failings when they were incarnate, and among other useful services they try to help their charges overcome those failings and weaknesses. And he goes on to say, which I'm not going to read, that many of the angels who are helping us with our plan had the same weaknesses when they were on the earth as people that they're helping, and therefore they understand and have a quote-unquote inside track as to how to help their mortal charges overcome their weaknesses. Very interesting. Heavenly Ways of Earth's Graduates. No authors, not allowed to give their names. Uh, World War I soldiers. There is great need that his angels be given charge over these because of the satanic forces know who are destined for great and powerful blows against their diabolical schemes. Often, those who realize early in life that they are on earth to do a great work are so misunderstood and ridiculed under the influence which dark forces have gained over the adults in charge of them that they are made insane by the frustration of spirit warning against the circumstances of the physical life. I quoted that part in a lecture on the veil. Continuing on, these dedications are implanted in the innermost center of the consciousness at birth waiting to be brought out and fulfilled, even to the very end of a long, frustrated physical life. The successful life is the one that becomes conscious of the purpose for which it was incarnate, incarnated and fulfills it. We're successful when we find out what our plan or purpose on the earth is and we get to it and get it accomplished. Too often, the subconscious unreasonably presents this inner spiritual dedication of prenatal purpose to the physical being as unfulfilled physical desire, and the body seeks its fulfillment in overindulgences, in eating, drinking, intoxicants, or sexual gratification. This is because the dark forces have entered into the physical being to use his faculties to satisfy their own lusts for their gratification, which they are not able to get in any other way. And we've read bits and pieces along the way. And uh, I'll have several lectures on Satan and evil spirits and possession. The problem of human behavior can only be understood in its true meaning in the light of this fact. The dark forces are vampires and thrive on human lusts. Led by the Hand of Christ, Suzanne Freeman, 
page 78 and 79. She has a very unique experience in her near death. She sees quite a number of religious leaders uh, and some of them are from her faith. Uh, she, she's a, a Latter-day Saint and she sees Joseph Smith and Brigham Young but she also sees prophets from the Old Testament and th this experience is the one that she had with Joseph who was sold into Egypt. Page 78, I quote, Then Joseph said to me, What you did was very noble. She yanked her hand away from Jesus Christ and said, I'm not going with you, I'm going back to the earth. Well, he promised her, If you will come with me, I promise that you can go back to the earth and be with your children. And so she's granted this uh, marvelous tour in the spirit world and then she goes back to her body. So now she's with Joseph. I didn't know it was his deep voice on the words he spoke that made, made me go weak in the knees. It wasn't from fear because I wasn't the least bit afraid of him. I knew that if I wanted to climb up those steps and take a seat on the golden throne, he would be happy to move aside and let me sit there for as long as I wanted to. Then I realized that the thing that set my heart quivering was a tiny sense of longing in his voice, an echo from his earthly time when his mother died. Then his sorrow was compounded when he was taken from his father, Jacob, by his jealous brothers and sold into slavery. It had all been part of the divine plan. And Joseph had, of course, forgiven his brothers. Still, he knew what it was like to grow up without a mother to watch over him. And he knew what it was to be robbed of his father's guidance when he was just a young man. Although it had only been a brief period of his earth life, he truly knew the pains of being orphaned. Joseph had a plan. And so the thing that I'm hoping will come as a result of these many, many quotes is that we will realize too that we have a plan and it's just as important for us to accomplish ours once we find out what it is as it is for anybody else on this earth because we're all in the mix together one great whole Personal plan number three. Um, you know, in, in when we go to court and we're in need of witnesses, usually two will satisfy. Sometimes one, but in every case, every case, every lecture I have given about uh, the parts of the plan, life review, crossing over, I've got many times dozens and dozens and dozens. In this particular situation, I think I must have more than 30 or 40. You may not hear them all. And uh, yet, there are some who doubt that there was a pre-existence and that we have a plan. But we have all of these witnesses. Okay, I continue on with the personal plan, 
Visions of Glory by John Pontius. And I'm quoting from page 16. It is interesting to me, though, that the negative impact of my actions on people was not the subject of my life review. It was there and I viewed it. But it seemed to matter less than the good I did and how it rippled down throughout their lives. When I saw the negative parts of my life, the message to me wasn't how bad it was, but that, I, that if I continued that behavior, it had the potential to take me away from the specific work that the Lord intended for me to accomplish in my lifetime. Sounds like a plan. It wasn't judgmental, just instructive. To achieve my fullest potential, I needed to comply with the covenants that I had made pre-mortally, or I would not accomplish the purposes of my life. I have to remind myself that God was not showing a life review to a person who was actually leaving mortality. He knew he was going back. So my experience may have de-emphasized my mistakes to encourage and teach me. I have the sense that if I had actually died, there would have been no purpose in warning me, and the weight of my negative acts would have been of greater consequence. Finding out what we covenanted in pre-mortality to do on earth is a continually unfolding discovery. Sometimes we can only know a tiny next step. Sometimes we are blessed with a sweeping vision of what we will become and do. I was being taught that I had to deliberately choose to be upon the path that God was laying before me no matter how it came to my understanding, doing everything right that I know to do. Now I'm on page 32 with this quote. It was stunning to realize that life is so much more intricate than we can imagine or envision while in this mortal body. God has provided a complex and inspired system to exalt us. A big part of it is to give us the opportunity to be in a body, a body that desires almost everything contrary to God's plan. Jesus Christ exposes us via the Holy Spirit to all that is true, speaking to our spirit every time we must choose between good and evil. Then we sin, we can repent and obey his laws to let the atonement work for us. All of this process is designed by God to bring about spirit with our body into to bring about our spirit within our body into compliance with the laws of God and to return bodily and body and soul inseparably connected back to the presence of God to be judged, to report back. In our uh, lectures on the pre-existence, the, the pre-mortal decisions that we made lead us to the point where our plan, we sit down and we evaluate our upcoming mortal life, we discuss it with angels and there are adjustments perhaps as, as we'll talk about, uh, and there's an approval, and God's will uh, 
agrees with it, and that becomes our life's plan. The Message by Lance Richardson. I'm on page 56 and 57. At that moment, I was once again wrapped in the love of my God. Yet the feelings inside me spoke that He was more than that. The Spirit inside me gave me understanding, understanding beyond all that I had ever known. God indeed was my Father. I was His Son. He was my Heavenly Father. He was my Creator. And more than that, he loved me as much as I love each of my children, but even more perfectly. I knew it and comprehended it completely at that moment. I felt the truth surge through my spirit, just as blood courses through a mortal's veins. I thought back to that moment only hours earlier when I had looked into the eyes of my son and felt an intensity a love beyond any, beyond any love I had felt. It was this kind of love my God, my Father, had for me. Then my memory went further. The whole plan of life was a pattern of our former life in heaven. I'm going to read that again. The whole plan of life was a pattern of our former life in heaven. I had heavenly parents. There was indeed a father, and most certainly a mother in heaven, who loved me. God is no respecter of persons. He loves all of his children equally, but he does not bless us all equally. He can only bless us according to our obedience. But even though you or I or both of us may not have a near-death experience, it's my hope that we can take the experiences of our brothers and sisters who have had a near-death experience and uh, appropriately put some of those things into our own lives and understanding, and perhaps we can make more sense out of why we're here and what's happening to us. Okay, My Time in Heaven by Richard Sigmund, quoting from page 122. On a beautiful pulpit-like structure was a book that looked like a Bible. It was signed across the front with these words, My covenant will not break. I will not alter the thing that has gone out of my mouth. I was astonished. I was reminded of the shed blood of the Lord and of the price he paid to redeem me, and again I wept unconditionally, uncontrollably, I'm sorry. The book opened by itself, and then suddenly Jesus was there by my side. He said, this is my plan for your life, and I will honor it as long as you honor it, and live under my Father's demand for your life. Methodist minister. Interesting insight into the plan. Won't be altered if we are obedient. Okay. There is no death. Sarah Manet. Page 51. 
I tried to grasp the thought that it wasn't my time to die, and more understanding began to flood into my mind. Apparently, all of us have an allotted length of time to spend on the earth. No righteous person in this world dies before his or her time. Now, how they die, that's a different story. So when a beautiful little child dies, or a beloved grandma or grandpa, or a 16-year-old nephew or sweet neighbor, we should not be overly grieved. If they were good people, their death is correct according to their plan, not our understanding. Their plan even though it may be a time of sadness to those left behind. Sometimes a person's time can be cut short by use of drugs or other poor choices regarding how they care for their body, drive a car, jump out of planes, yada yada. They lose the benefit of that time on earth, but as I perceived it, the timing is more important than the way or manner a person dies. Timing. Uh, Sarah has a question and answer, and I think I've read this one, uh, shared it before, but I'm going to do it again. Question. You say bad things that happen to us are really for our good and almost nothing happens by accident. That question is on page 115 in her book. Her answer is this. Almost everything that happens to us in our lives, including every person that we meet, is part of a plan for each one of us. Very little of it is by accident. Our lives and the surrounding circumstances are all part of a huge plan that we are a part of. What we do and how we react when these trials happen is up to us. And so the choices we make have a great deal to do with it as well. But there are forces working hard to arrange circumstances for us and then influence our decisions in responding to them. But we always have our free will. Both good and evil spirits pull strings in our lives to make events happen. Do you think you could travel down all these paths throughout your life and by coincidence run into just the right person at just the right time, in just the right place, without some help? God arranges things so everything that happens to us can work for our benefit, if we allow it to. Sorry. Personal plan number four. Again, um, This is Personal Plan Lecture 4, 
Learning from the Light by Dr. John Lerma. I'm not being paid for this, but his two books are marvelous insights. The experiences he has with his in his hospice work of people leaving their body, going into the spirit world, and coming back and having conversations. Two good books I highly recommend. I recommend all these books that I'm using. Okay, I'm on page 114. And again, he's uh, had some experiences and he's summarizing some of those experiences. Um, and they're not direct quotes from near-deathers, but they're his observation as they have passed. With regard to the planning of our lives before our birth, Sarah told me that some souls are too overzealous to make a difference and choose extremely demanding and punishing lives. However, God is intimately involved in the architecture of our earthly role and assures he will never allow a soul to engage in a role that is beyond their capacity to endure. Sounds a bit like 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Okay, we're now over in page 164. Quote, Uh, this little girl dies and her mother and Dr. Lerma are involved in some questions. Here's one of them. Mary, is there any other way that is less painful to accomplish God's loving plan? Mom, I am told there is no other way to achieve this vast level of infinite freedom and power, but to be born into a fragile, complex body and world of two sides, where the human senses can create choices such as joy and love or sadness and hatred. Every soul must learn to reconcile these choices through love and forgiveness, so that our free will can have the choice to invite God to live inside of us. It is at this stage that both can experience each other's love, which is and has always been God. It is about that choice that God created us for. When we invite Him into our souls, I am told His joy is beyond measure. Mary, did your family choose this level of suffering? Yes, Mom. Did our family, I'm sorry, did our family choose this level of suffering? Yes, Mom. Our family chose one of the most painful but rewarding ways to save souls and usher in God's plan. Everyone's part is equally important. But some like you and Tabitha, his sister, her sister, continue on earth to affect a larger part. Mom and Tabitha, don't lose hope. Your part is almost done. Then we can all be together to help others. Another patient, uh, another insight. It's quite a long one. Bear with me. Page 194 to 196. One evening during Ramadan, Sariana's family was finishing their evening prayers and getting ready to eat. Her 45-year-old 40 mother and father 
and 14-year-old sister, 12-year-old brother, and she, now 15 years old, sat at the table and began praying. All of a sudden, their father screamed to get under the table. They all held hands and closed their eyes. Syriana recalls vividly at that moment that just before a missile exploded, they were all startled by the bright, brightest white light they had ever seen. She remembers looking at the faces of her family, and instead of seeing intense fright, she saw them smiling and looking up toward the tunnel of light. Syriana said it was beautifully white and inviting, uncovering all of them. Time and space seemed to have slowed down. We then heard a popping sound, after which our individual spirits were able to escape our motionless bodies. Our spirits floated from the bottom of the table. In fact, we floated right through the table. It felt so cool to do so. We were all floating, transparent light beings now moving toward the tunnel of the white light, the whitest light I had ever seen. My family and I were immediately drawn by the love and joy that radiated from the tunnel along with the appearance of several transparent beings like ourselves. I'm going to pause there and make a comment. Into my mind comes an idea that I need to share or I will forget it. And that is that there are several near-deathers maybe I'll collect it and do a lecture on it, who have indicated that just prior to an accident, they left their bodies, just as these, this family left their bodies before the bomb went off. And I, I know there are individuals, in uh, my experience, who fear the pain of death. And this might be comforting to them. It is to me, because I'm one of them. Uh, don't like a lot of pain. Anyway, there are some who have expressed that, that they leave before the pain comes. As we walked from the interior of the light tunnel toward us, we all recognized them to be our family and friends. It was Grandma and Grandpa and many of my friends who had either been killed or who had died recently from cancer. Their faces were so young and peaceful looking, and their robes or vestments were whiter than the whitest snow. Through telepathy, they spoke to all of us collectively and explained that God had allowed time to stop to allow for separation from their bod physical bodies in an attempt to keep them from the pain of the missile. One of the angels explained that not all of them would be entering the light this time. Only mom, your brother and sister are to enter the light. Your father and you, Syriana, will remain on earth to accomplish the loving lessons God and both of you agreed upon a long, long time ago. God is so proud of all of you and will never abandon you. Your Father and you will need to go back to finish your divine design which will not only bring your souls back to the Creator, but will also draw back countless numbers of souls. The key is to open your heart to the final truth that will set you free. Your mother and siblings have accepted the truth and now are being accepted in the kingdom of God. Syria. Syriana asked, Why can't you tell me what the truth is? I thought that we had learned and followed the teachings of the Quran. 
The angel told Syriana that there was nothing to worry about. You will see the truth soon, but will be unaware that what you are seeing is the one truth, capitalized. The one truth will find you and you will know what was inside you all along. This one truth needs to be accepted by all the world, so you are not alone. Just before her mother left, she told her husband and Syriana to forgive those who killed them and above all to remember to open their hearts to the one truth. The one truth we have thought all of our lives was a lie. And she goes on, and I'm not going to read it, but she goes on to tell uh, the process and how she discovered the one truth. She met the Savior and understood his mission to the earth, the atonement, and he was the one truth that she was to seek for. Last quote in uh, Learning from the Light, page 228. Many were told they would come back, uh, and uh, Dr. Lerma here is, is making some summary statements uh, after a patient has died. Many were told they would come back, as it was not their time. They were often told they had much more of life to experience so their afterlife would be more fruitful and full of joy and love. Most did not want to come back, but a gentle nudge by large blue to white loving beings, as well as a visual reminder of the unfinished business on earth, their plan, they had agreed to long ago, almost always changed their will. The spirit light told them that God's plan was beyond their wildest imaginations. Many recall being told by their deceased loved ones that we, <coughs> excuse me, that we are never alone and not to fear God as he is that unawakened part of us that does not know hatred, jealousy anger, selfishness, revenge, egotism, condemnation, or judgment. They emphasize that all these attitudes and personality traits come from our sinful self, the ego. It is the self-defeating and self-separating ego that humans need to recognize within ourselves and others, and defeat through understanding in order to awaken the God within us. <coughs> Excuse me. To Heaven and Back by Mary Neal. She's the one that was kayaking in Chile and uh, drowned now a doctor in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, or it was at least at this printing. And I'm quoting Dr. Neal on page 98 and 99. We are each given the opportunity and privilege to come to earth for different reasons. Sometimes we come in order that we may personally develop and strengthen the fruits of our spirit, those of love, kindness, patience, joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Sometimes we come to help someone else develop the fruits of the Spirit. We all come to earth to become more Christ-like, as noted in Romans chapter 18. In preparation for our journey to earth, we are able to make a basic outline for our life. This is not to imply that we, the humans, are entirely in charge of our life's design. It is more like God creates it, 
then we review it and discuss it with our personal planning angel. Within the algorithm are written branch points in our lives at which times we may exit returning to God or we may be redirected to a different task and a goal. We may be directed to these branch points by our own conscious choice and by our circumstances or we may be pushed along by angelic intervention. Have you ever shown up somewhere at just the right time? What, when you think back on your life, can you remember a person who briefly entered your life saying something or doing something that impacted your life out of proportion to what they actually said or did? What were the circumstances that brought you together with your spouse? Or the detailed circumstances of other such notable events in your life? Have you ever been randomly thinking of someone who then unexpectedly shows up or contacts you? Has something ever happened that left you thinking, that's weird? Consider whether these are sets of coincidences or whether they might be orchestrated events, evidence of God's hand in our lives. Bam.